Hi, this week we, we will be reading chapters 23 through 26 of your I Malala. If you haven't already, pull up the quiz and follow along as we read, because we'll stop at the questions. We'll go ahead and get started. Chapter 23, A Day Like Any Other. The second Tuesday in October started out the same as any other. I was late, as usual, because I'd slept in, as usual. I'd stayed up extra late after talking to Moniba, studying for my year-end exam in Pakistani studies. I'd already done a disappointing job on my physics exam, so I would have to get a perfect score on this exam if I was going to take the number one spot back from Malke Anor. It was a point of pride. It was a sibling thing. If I didn't come in first, I'd never hear the end of it from Kushal. So, first question. What was a point of pride for Malala? What was a point of pride for Malala? I gulped down a bit of fried egg and chapati with my tea and raced out the door, just in time to catch the bus crammed with other girls on their way to school. I was happy that morning, ridiculously happy. Before I left, my father had been teasing Atal, saying he could be my secretary when I became prime minister. And of course, Atal said no, he would be the prime minister, and I would be his secretary. It seemed as if everything in my life was going well. My mother was learning to read. I was on my way to the school I loved, and Maniba and I were friends again. I told myself not to worry about Make and Or and instead to work hard, and I thought I should thank God for all I had, so I did. I whispered a prayer of thanks before I managed a few last minutes of studying for my exam. Oh, and God, I said, please don't forget to give me first place since I have worked so hard. I always prayed the most during exams. Usually I did not pray on time, which means praying five times a day, a religious duty. But at this time of year, my friends and I all prayed on time. I asked for help with my exams or to help come in first in the class. Our teachers always told us, though, God won't give you marks if you don't work hard. God showers us with his blessings, but he is honest as well. So I always worked hard, too. So question number two. What did Malala's teachers always tell Malala and her classmates? So what did her teachers always tell her and her classmates? Exam morning passed and I felt confident I had done well. Afterward, Maniba suggested that we stay behind and wait for the second pickup, which we did often so that we could chat before going home. When the diner arrived, I looked around for a tall. My mother had told him to ride home with me that day. So, question number three real quick. What does the word Dyna mean? So, this one should be in the back of your book in that glossary. So, what does the word Dyna mean? But soon I was distracted as the girls gathered around to watch our driver do a magic trick with a disappearing pebble. No matter how hard we tried, we could not figure out what his secret. I forgot all about it all as we piled in, into the van. We squeezed in and took our usual places, about 20 girls in all. Maniba was next to me and the rest of my friends were across from us on the other bench. A little girl named Haina grabbed the seat next to me, the spot where my friend Shazia usually sat, forcing Shazia to sit on the bench in the middle where we often put our backpacks. Shazia looked so unhappy, I asked Hina to move. Just as the van was about to pull away, a tall came running. The doors were shut, but he jumped onto the tailboard on the back. This was a new trick of his, riding home, hanging off the tailboard. It was dangerous, and our bus driver had had enough of it. Sit inside, Atal, he said, but Atal didn't budge. Sit inside with the girls, Atal, Khan, you saw Zai, or I won't take you, the driver said with more force this time. Atal yelled that he would rather walk home than sit with the girls. He jumped down and stormed off in a huff. It was hot and sticky inside the diner as we bounced along Mingora's crowded rush hour streets, and one of the girls started a song to pass the time. The air was thick with the familiar smell of diesel, bread, and kebab mixed with the stench from the nearby stream, where everyone dumped trash. We turned off the main road and at the army checkpoint, as always, and passed the poster that read, Wanted Terrorists. Just as we passed the little giant snack factory, the road became oddly quiet and the bus slowed to a halt. I don't remember a young man stopping us and asking the driver if this was the Kushal school bus. I don't remember the other man jumping onto the tailboard and leading into the back where we were all sitting. I never asked, heard him ask, who is Malala? And I didn't hear the crack, crack, crack of the three bullets. The last thing I remember is the thinking about my exam the next day. And after that, everything went black. So, two questions there. Question number four. What sound did the three bullets make? What sound did they make? And who was shot? So everything went black for Malala, so who can we predict was shot? 
And with that, we will move on to part five, a new life far from home. In chapter 24, a place called Birmingham. I woke up on 16 October to a lot of people standing around looking at me. They all had four eyes, two noses, and two mouths. I blinked, but it did no good. I was seeing everything in double. The first thing I thought was, thank God I'm not dead. So question number six, what was the first thing Malala thought? What was the first thing Malala thought? But I had no idea where I was or who these people were. They were speaking English, although they seemed to be from different countries. I tried to talk since I could speak English, but no sound came out. There seemed to be a tube of some kind in my throat, a tube that had stolen my voice. I was in a high bed, and all around me, complicated machines beeped and purred. I understood then. I was in a hospital. My heart clenched in panic. If I was in a hospital, where were my parents? Was my father hurt? Was he alive? Something had happened to me, I knew. But I was sure something happened to my father as well. A nice woman wearing a headscarf came to my side. She told me that her name was Rahana, and that she was Muslim, chuckling. She began to pray in Urdu. I instantly felt calm and comforted and safe. As I listened to the beautiful, soothing words of the Holy Quran, I closed my eyes and drifted off. When I opened my eyes next, I saw that I was in a green room with no windows and very bright lights. The nice Muslim woman was gone, and a doctor and nurse were in her place. The doctor spoke to me in Urdu. His voice was oddly muffled, as if he were speaking from a great distance. He told me that I was safe and that he had brought me from Pakistan. I tried to talk, but couldn't, so I tried to trace letters on my hand, thinking I could spell out a question. The nurse left and came back with a piece of paper and a pen for me, but I couldn't write properly. I wanted to give them my father's number. I wanted to write a question, but everything came out all jumbled. So the nurse wrote the alphabet on a piece of paper, and I pointed at the letters. The first word I spelled out was father, then country. Where was my father? I wanted to know, and what country was this? The doctor's voice was still hard to hear, but he seemed to be saying I was in a place called Birmingham. I didn't know where that was. Only later did I find out it was in England. So, question number seven. Where is Malala now? So, where is Malala now? And then you can also answer the next question, which is, what is the one question Malala wants to know? So, what is the one thing she is asking for? Sorry. I forgot to take these off. And then we'll keep going. He hadn't said anything about my father. The only reason there could be. There, that was it. Let me restart. He hadn't said anything about my father. Why not? Something had happened to him. That was the only reason there could be. I had it in my head that this doctor had found me on the roadside and that he did not know my father was also hurt. Or that he didn't know how to find my father. I wanted to give him my father's phone number so he could tell him, your daughter is here. I moved ever so slightly to spell out father again, and a blinding pain cut through my head. It was as if a hundred razors were in my school, clattering and rattling around. I tried to breathe. Then the nurse leaned down and dabbed at my left ear with a piece of gauze, and blood came away on the cloth. My ear was bleeding. What did that mean? I tried to lift my hand to touch it, but I noticed, as if from a distance, my hand did not seem to be working properly. What had happened to me? Nurses and doctors came in and out. No one told me anything. Instead, they asked me questions. I nodded and shook my head in reply. They asked if I knew my name. I nodded. They asked if I could move my left hand. I shook my head. They had so many questions, and yet they wouldn't answer mine. It was all too much. The questions, the pain in my head, the worry about my father. When I closed my eyes, I didn't see the darkness, only a bright light, as if the sun were shining under my eyelids. I was fading in and out, but I never felt as if I had slept. There was only long stretches of being awake, my pain, my head filled with pain and questions, and then not. The room I was in in the ICU was in the ICU and didn't have any windows, so I never knew if it was day or night. I only knew that no one had answered my constant question, where was my father? But eventually a new question joined it when I looked around the room at all the complicated medical equipment. Who would pay for this? A lady walked in and told me her name was Dr. Fiona Reynolds. She spoke to me as if we were old friends. She handed me a green teddy bear, which I thought was an odd color for it, and a pink notebook. The first thing I wrote was, thank you. Then I wrote, why I have no father, and my father has no money. Who will pay for this? Your father is safe, she said. He is in Pakistan. Don't worry about the payment. 
If my father was safe, why wasn't he here? And where was my mother? I had more questions for Dr. Fiona, but the words I needed would not come to my mind. She seemed to understand. Something bad happened to you, but you're safe now. What had happened? I tried to remember. All sorts of images floated through my head. I did not, didn't know what was real and what was a dream. I am on a bus with my father and two men shoot us. I see a crowd gathered around me as I lie on a bed or maybe a stretcher. I can't see my father and I'm trying to speak out. Where is Abba? Where is my father? But I can't speak and then I see him and I feel joy and relief. I feel someone hovering over me, a man whose hands poised above my neck, ready to choke me. I am on a stretcher and my father is reaching out to me. I'm trying to wake up to go to school, but I can't. Then I see my school and my friends and I can't reach them. I see a man in black pointing the gun at me. I see doctors trying to stick a tube in my throat. I tell myself, you are dead. Then I realize the angel has not yet come to ask the questions a Muslim hears after death. Who is your God? Who is your prophet? I realize then I can't be dead and I fight and struggle and kick and try to wake from this terrible nightmare. These images seem very real, yet I knew they couldn't all be, but somehow I had ended up in a place called Birmingham, in a room full of machines with only the green teddy bear at my side.